A student was found murdered after going for a morning jog. On the 22nd of February this year, Athens was shaken. 22-year-old Lakin Hope Riley was a nursing student. She originally studied at the University of Georgia. She then transferred to Augusta University's College of Nursing. She loved running and decided to go for a jog on the morning in question. Her friends became really concerned when she failed to return home. She was reported missing at 12.07 p.m. Police officers attended the university and immediately started scouring the area. They searched the local areas and particularly the areas that were popular with runners and hikers. Tragically, they discovered the young woman's body in a forest near Lake Herrick. She was found unconscious and not breathing and had visible injuries. This was at around 12.38 p.m. Her cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma. The following day, a man named Jose Ibarra, aged 26, was arrested. He's expected to be charged with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated battery, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, kidnapping, hindering a 911 call and concealing the death of another. He's not actually a student at the university and police suspect that he may have acted alone. Officers are calling this a crime of opportunity and they don't believe that he knew the victim prior. This is by far one of the most unlucky deaths caught on camera explained. The man that you see sitting down right here naked was 26-year-old Nathaniel Christian. And he was doing his normal stuff at night, but was doing it naked for some reason. Nothing happens in the video at first, but at one point, Nathaniel gets up to smoke his cigarette by the window. Most likely so it doesn't make his room smell like cigarette smoke. But suddenly, the dog that you see sitting down right here, walks right up behind Nathaniel as he's leaning out the window smoking and shoves his nose into his gooch slash butthole area. This obviously makes Nathaniel freak out and he suddenly then falls out the window to his death. There's really no information at all surrounding this tragic accident besides the man name and the video of the accident happening. And since there's little to no information, people speculate that this video is fake but I have no idea. Some people say he died from the fall and others say his room wasn't that high up and you can hear him hit the bushes after a couple seconds. All in all, this is a very unfortunate accident, and if it's indeed real, this is definitely one of the most unlucky deaths ever. His dog just literally sniffed his butt and caused him to completely freak out. If you ever look up the video, you can tell just how unlucky it really is. If this is real, rest in peace in Nathaniel, and what are the odds of this happening? This two-year-old girl got eaten alive by crocodiles, and this is a massive trigger warning. Okay, so this happened at a farm in Cambodia, and the child's name is Rome Wraith Neri, who was just a two-year-old girl. While her mother was occupied with a newborn child, Rome wandered and was playing unsupervised, and managed to pass over a fence which should have protected her from the side of the crocodiles. The family, having a farm, also had a ground for crocodiles, since it's a very profitable business in Cambodia. But sadly, the little girl was able to somehow pass over the fence and ended up being eaten alive and devoured by the crocodiles. The parents discovered the awful scene when the father came home from work and found the skull of his two-year-old daughter. A passerby had also taken a video of the gruesome scene, but I really don't recommend looking it up. And the only thing left of the two-year-old girl was her skull that the parents retrieved. This is just so sad and awful, and it kind of reminds me of that case in Florida when the elderly woman was walking her dog and she tripped next to a pond and was eaten alive by a crocodile. Now, there's many questions surrounding the case of Rome, like why wasn't the area of the crocodiles more secure? And why would you let a two-year-old girl out on her own with 60 crocodiles on the property? Either way, nobody wanted this to happen and it's honestly just an extremely tragic accident. I can't imagine the pain the parents were feeling and may Rome rest in peace. This is the unsettling evidence that was found after a woman vanished off a cruise ship. It was December 2004 and Annette Mizener was 37 years old. The mother from Wisconsin had actually won a nine-day cruise to the Mexican Riviera, so she was obviously thrilled. She boarded the ship with her parents and her 17-year-old daughter, Danielle. However, on the fourth of the month, things turned from a dream to a nightmare. Annette left her room to meet up with her parents as planned at 10pm to go to bingo. Worryingly though, she never showed up. Her dad was concerned and heard rumours that she'd been spotted around 7.30 at the casino. He went to try and find her but had no luck. He then heard over the intercom that a bag had been found. It turned out to be Annette's bag and it was recovered from the railings on a lower deck of the ship at around 10.10pm. 10, 10 
Beading from her handbag was all over the floor, which indicated signs of a struggle. Then came the most worrying discovery of all. A CCTV camera had been covered with paper. It was as if somebody was deliberately trying to cover over the camera so nothing was seen. Annette was declared missing and a Coast Guard aircraft and Navy ship searched the area for 16 hours. Tragically, they failed to find the missing mum. Now, Annette's daughter Danielle actually claimed a strange man had been harassing her mum and they'd reported it to staff, but nothing had been done. Annette's husband feels that she may have fallen by accident or could have been pushed overboard. Her fate remains a mystery to this day. This is by far the saddest and most disturbing thing ever live streamed. Koran Harvey, a 14 year old boy, tragically lost his life in a heartbreaking incident. He was one of two young cousins who were live streaming on Instagram from an apartment bathroom in St. Louis. During this ill-fated moment, Paris Harvey, a 12-year-old girl, accidentally shot Koran before turning the gun on herself. The family believes it was a freak accident and after seeing the video, it certainly looks like that. Both Koran and Paris were extremely close, often making videos and sharing pranks. Paris, a 7th grader, was known for her humor and love for getting her hair and nails done. And Koran, an 8th grader, was a goofy kid who could perform impressive backflips and their lives were cut short in a moment of youthful curiosity and misjudgment. The two young kids were making a video on Instagram Live in which they were playing with a gun, when Paris accidentally shot Koran in the back of the head killing him. And in a moment of panic and complete fear, Paris picked up the gun and turned it on herself. And you see all this happen live in the live stream. After this happens, the other family members in the apartment run over to the bathroom and try and get in but the door is being blocked by the bodies of the two young kids. The family members begin to freak out after realizing what just happened. The parents had no idea that the kids had the gun and it's not clear where the gun came from. I don't recommend looking up this video for obvious reasons and it's just something you really don't want to see. It's extremely sad and very disturbing. This heartbreaking incident serves as a reminder of the importance of gun safety and responsible handling. May Paris and Koran Harvey rest in peace. This is just so heartbreaking. When a woman stole a man's phone, she had no idea she would uncover a double murder. It was the 30th of September, 2019 in Alaska. A woman had been living on the streets and to try and get some money, she stole a phone from a man's truck. The man in question was Brian Smith. However, the woman got a whole lot more than she bargained for. When she looked through the phone, she found graphic images and videos of a murder. Between 2017 and 2018, 52-year-old Brian had killed two women. The victims were Catherine Henry, aged 30, and Veronica Abuchuk, aged 52. After finding the murder videos and photos, the woman handed in the memory card to police. There were a total of 39 images and 12 videos. The evidence showed Kathleen's killing in a hotel room at the Marriott Hotel in Anchorage. Brian was filmed strangling her. Her body was found on train tracks and the coroner ruled that she had been killed through strangulation. After police confronted Brian with the evidence, he finally admitted to killing Veronica too. Her skull was discovered by mushroom pickers along a highway. He confessed to having Veronica around at his house while his wife was away. He'd apparently asked her to have a shower and got irate when she wouldn't, so he shot her in the head. At his trial, he was found guilty of first degree and second degree murder, as well as tampering with evidence and SA. This pedophile was recently arrested in Texas and charged with doing the unthinkable. This is Don Stephen McDougall. He's 42 years old. And as you can tell, he's not the friendliest guy. So Don has a really long and violent rap sheet. He's been in and out of prison throughout his life. He was previously convicted of trying to entice a child into bed with him, where he started removing undergarments and stuff like that before the child hopped out. And yeah, Don has done a lot of terrible things in his life. But recently, just last week, this 11-year-old girl, Audrey Cunningham, went missing. Basically, she was dropped off at the school bus stop by her father earlier that morning. But after that, she went missing. Young Audrey never even made it to school that day. And just in the last day, authorities located her body after she had been missing for several days in a body of water. Now, obviously, this is an extremely tragic story, but it's also an infuriating one. Like I said before, Don, the main suspect, was a previously convicted child predator. 
but he was also the roommate of Audrey Cunningham's father, Joshua. And Joshua would frequently leave Audrey with his roommate while he went to work. That means that Don was given unfiltered access to the young girl pretty frequently. And what's frightening is that when Audrey went missing, Don actually stepped up and said he'd volunteer to help search for her. But yeah, this is a really disturbing case. I don't know why this guy was ever allowed around a child ever again in the first place. And I think that there should definitely be stricter laws in place with child predators so that this can be prevented from happening. This is by far one of the worst ways somebody has ever died, and whatever you do, don't look up the video. This is the most disturbing sporting accident I ever came across. On January 19th, 1991, the Lammerthorne race was cancelled due to a horrible skiing accident. Gurnett Rangstandler, who was a 20-year-old contestant, was going downhill at full speed when he suddenly lost control as he was approaching the finish line. And he then slammed head-on into safety nets at extremely high speeds. This then trapped one of his skis inside the net, which resulted in his right leg almost being completely torn off. He also fractured his pelvis and was literally ripped in half. The impact caused serious internal injuries, fractures, and nerve damages. He was then transported by a helicopter to a hospital in Switzerland, where he received several blood transfusions, but despite receiving numerous blood transfusions, both during and after the operation, he later passed away from severe pelvic bleeding. The video is extremely graphic and I'll explain it to you right now. In the video you see Gurnett going down a ski mountain when he suddenly goes airborne. He then collides with the safety net mid-air while going full speed and his body then starts sliding down the mountain but at this point you immediately notice something is wrong. As his body is spitting out of control a trail of blood is following him staining the entire mountain in the process. And at this point you see a lot of blood and you also see Gurnett almost ripped in half. His body then stops at the bottom of the hill as a pool of blood forms around him and people come to help. This video is just awful because it's one of those things that you can't imagine ever happening, but it does. How does a safety net rip somebody's body in half? It's just honestly insane and please don't look up the video because it's extremely disturbing. We had Casos de la Vida Real episode. For those who don't know, it was a Mexican TV show that depicted real life cases and had actors act those cases out. This specific episode is called Maniatico. Watching this reminded me why we were all like traumatized when we were kids watching this. This episode is about a woman who is with a, a bullfighter. It starts off with her going to him at his bull practice. She goes to him asking him for money because they need money for food for the kids. And then he starts getting aggressive saying, why are you here? You're f***ing lying to me. You came here to f***ing see men, didn't you? Ends up slapping the shit out of her. The next scene is her talking to her mom. Their mom is saying, yo, leave his ass. I know you could do this shit by yourself. She ends up going to like this bar or somewhere where she's singing. As she's singing, there's a guy watching her, amazed by her singing and stuff. They end up having like a little moment. And of course, the boyfriend ends up barging in, sees what the fuck is happening, slaps her again. She gets home, ends up grabbing her, and then beats the out of her. So at that point, she ends up breaking up with him. She goes to pursue her dream, which was to be a singer. It fast forwards to her being like a good singer, and now she's dating the guy that was... What a crush on her. And then one night, she has a gig, and she leaves both of her kids with her mom to babysit. And out of nowhere, the ex-husband barges in, goes to the room where the kids are at, locks it. In the episode, you see him... Bro, he's a fucking psychopath. That show, how the fuck? This is one of the darkest episodes I've seen. What the <laughs> fuck is this? That might be worse than everything else we talked about, bro. Do you think a band could be responsible for making someone want to murder you? Elise Paler was a 15-year-old high school student from California. It was July 1995, and she lived with her parents. On the 22nd of the month, she failed to return home from school. Her concerned parents rang police. She'd seemingly vanished into thin air. There were no suspects. There was no indication of what on earth had happened to her. It was then an agonizing eight months before a breakthrough. 17 year old Royce Casey had seemingly converted to Christianity. It appeared that he wanted to repent his sins and confess to being there when she was killed. He came forward and confessed to police. He told them he could show them where her body was. He did just that, and she was finally identified via dental records. Royce claimed that she was killed as part of a satanic ritual. He said it was performed with two other teenage boys. These were Jacob Della Schmutt and Joseph Fiorella. 
They had reportedly recently started a metal band and felt that in order for people to take them seriously, they needed to sacrifice someone. They selected Elise and decided to lure her to a secluded area to commit the hideous murder. They tortured the teenager through strangulation and stabbing. They ensured that they stabbed her not enough to initially kill her instantly, but to prolong her death. She was also essayed after she died by at least one of the boys. The trio got life in prison, but were deemed to be eligible for parole at some point. I believe Royce has actually been released from prison now from what I can see. Jacob and Joseph are still behind bars. Elise's parents actually tried to sue thrash metal band Slayer, claiming that their music contributed to the daughter's death. They claimed that certain songs included lyrics that encouraged people to stalk, our torture, murder and commit acts of N on their daughter. They did not win this lawsuit. These two best friends killed an abusive husband together. Marianne and Wanda were the best of friends, like, all through their high school days. They were both members of the 4-H club, both active in the FFA, and after graduation, Marianne went out and she was looking for a bright new world, and Wanda looked all around her hometown and all she found was Earl. And y'all, it wasn't two weeks after she got married that Wanda started getting abused. She started wearing dark sunglasses, long sleeve blouses, makeup to cover her bruises. But she finally got the nerve to file for divorce and she let the law take it from there. But Earl walked right through that restraining order and put her in intensive care. And right away, Mary Ann flew in from Atlanta on a red-eye midnight flight and she held Wanda's hand and they worked out a plan and it didn't take them long to decide that Earl had to die. And y'all, they killed Earl together. They were mocking him and laughing at him as he was dying. They were saying things like, what? What's wrong with those black eyed peas? They tasted all right to me. Oh, what's the matter? You feeling weak? Why don't you lay down and sleep, Earl? Oh, ain't it dark all wrapped up in that tarp? It was sadistic, it was twisted, and they took a lot of pleasure in bringing an end to Earl. And now the cops came by to bring Earl in and they searched their house high and low. And they tipped their hats and they said, thank you ladies. If you hear from him, let us know, okay? But the weeks went by, spring turned to summer, summer turned into fall, and turns out Earl was a missing person that nobody missed at all. So the girls bought some land at a roadside stand out there on Highway 109, and they sell Tennessee ham, strawberry jam, and they don't lose any sleep at night because Earl had to die. Matter of fact, they held onto his body for a while, and they stuffed him in the trunk. They actually took his body to the lake. They had a picnic lunch. I mean, what they did to this guy was absolutely outrageous, but truth is, Earl had to die. Y'all, I hope you enjoyed the story today. My name is Jordan Rayner. I'm a recording artist trying to get a record deal. Hit follow, help me get to a million. And also, I've got a brand new EP called Revolver that just dropped on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes. It's freaking amazing. Please go give it a spin. Cheers. Goodbye. These two women committed one of the most disturbing crimes I've ever read about. I'm going to warn you, this story is extremely dark and disturbing, so viewer discretion is advised. So these two women's names are Stephanie Hurd and Sarah Zamora. And in 2014, both of them were arrested for participating in crush corn videos. Basically, crush corn is a very, very disturbing and demented category of corn that actually involves models mutilating live animals on camera. Oftentimes, they torture live animals for extended periods of time. For example, I've read about some of these videos depicting kittens getting their eyes poked out with high heels. And this stuff is just truly sick. And both of these women appeared in these videos. So this guy is the mastermind behind this whole operation. His name's Adam Redford. He's actually an heir to the Hammond organ fortune. And in the past, he's been in and out of prison for animal cruelty, go figure. But according to the police, Adam Redford is the reason why these videos exist. He was the one hiring the models, getting the animals, and filming this horrific, horrific stuff. And something else incredibly disturbing about all this is that there's actually a market for this type of content out there. There are sickos in this world who actually get off on watching videos and seeing photographs of animals being abused. I mean, that's just deeply disturbing to your core. But now for the part that's going to piss you off. Neither of these two, even though they were on video committing these crimes, were ever charged with anything after they were arrested. So neither of them had to face any legal repercussions for participating in these horrific abuses. And to my knowledge, Adam Redford, the leader of this disturbing ring, was also never arrested or charged. So he's out there somewhere in Florida, walking free right now. Who knows if he's producing more, what he's doing, but yeah, I mean, this is just some really dark, disturbing stuff. Happy Lagoma, guys. I hope you 
hope you're all having an amazing time. Well, we couldn't go anywhere because of the current situation, um, but we are having an epic time. Offshore we fired up the grill and the kids are just playing. The man you just saw in that video is a pedophile and he abused his own adopted children. So this guy is from Houston, Texas, and online he went by the name Haim Nassim Cohen. So he claimed on social media that he was a Hasidic Jew born in Brooklyn, New York. But in reality, his real name was Jeffrey Lujan Vigil, and he was born here in Texas. But we're gonna call him Haim for the rest of this TikTok. So Haim was big on social media, his TikTok had a big following because he adopted nine sons. And people all across the internet praised Haim for his thoughtless actions and how he was helping change these boys' lives. In the videos, he was always surrounded by his sons. They were playing games, doing challenges. But then in February of 2023, one of Haim's sons went to a podcast anonymously and reported that he was being abused by his own father. And that's when disturbing facts started to come to light. Like the fact that Haim was already out from a 2019 case that he was fighting involving child abuse as well. Eventually, six in total of the children came forward and said that they were essayed and abused by their own father, who, like I said before, is a stone-cold pedophile. One of the young victims even claimed that his adopted father would pepper spray him in the face until he submitted to the abuse. Prosecutors also said that this dirty dad kept his children locked up in their bedrooms until 4 p.m. almost every day, and he would only let them out if they were going to perform acts for him. Haim's son who went on the podcast also claimed that everything that he did was fake. He said that he only sat in a wheelchair when other people came around. He only brought out oxygen tanks when other people were around and that he was the most manipulative, biggest liar he's ever known. Thankfully, this guy is behind bars now. What a horrific story, but if you were to just look at the family's social media, you would have no idea that this was happening behind the scenes. Only God knows how frequently this is happening right now in America. Sometimes through frustrating addiction. The case of Richard Trenton Chase is a story which even the most depraved horror writer would struggle to create. Over the course of four weeks spanning across 1977 and 1978, Richard Chase took the lives of six innocent victims in Sacramento, California. His murders, gradually progressing violence, beginning with drive-by shootings and culminating in acts of cannibalism, necrophilia and extreme mutilation. This young man fell into a freezer and got mummified and this is one of the worst deaths imaginable explained. On November 28, 2009, 25-year-old Larry Mancata got into an argument with his parents and stormed out of the house with no shoes or socks on. And it is believed that he went to his work, which is the No Frills supermarket. Now, he was not scheduled to work this day, but his employer said that it's normal for employees to just come and go out of the store. But the thing is, after he entered the store, he was never seen again. That is until 2019 when a construction crew was inside of the store and they then found something extremely disturbing behind one of the coolers. Now, there's no pictures of the actual store's coolers when this happened, but I would imagine this is what they are referring to. Behind the cooler, they found the decomposed body of Larry Mancata. They first confirmed this by the clothing the corpse had on was the same that Larry had on that day. So they then took DNA samples from both of his parents and it was a 100% match. So, what happened? Okay, so in their store above their coolers was a little bit of open space. And we all know how sometimes people climb on top of the coolers and just walk around on top of it. And people that worked at this store would go on top of the coolers to get a little bit of a break. So what they believed happened was Larry climbed up there and he then slipped and fell into a crevice from behind the cooler to where the products were sold. There was a very narrow 18 inch passageway that he fell into. And it was roughly a 12 foot fall, which definitely wouldn't have killed him, but it could have injured him. Now the problem is, even if he was screaming, the coolers were so loud that nobody would have heard him. So he was in that little 18 inch gap for God knows how long until he died. And then his body just mummified over the years of being there. I can't even imagine being stuck in this situation. This is straight out of a horror movie. He had maybe enough room to move his head left to right only a couple inches. Customers even complained about a horrific order coming from behind the coolers. People were thinking maybe the butcher wasn't cleaning up the dry blood, but the staff of the store said no, it's perfectly clean. They did retrieve Larry's body and he was then laid to rest in 2019. 
Many people have questions about this case, like for 10 years, no other employee climbed up there to have a break. And did the store have cameras showing that he went there or showing what happened to him? The store closed in 2016 also, and it was completely abandoned for at least three years. This is just such a sad way to die, and I can't imagine the pain and anxiety Larry Mankata was going through. May he rest in peace, and this is just completely awful. This paranormal story will make the hairs on your neck stand straight up. A Reddit user that we'll call Mary moved into a rent house with her boyfriend and another roommate. And she said from the time they moved in, it just never really felt like home. It didn't have that cozy, safe vibe. In fact, it was the exact opposite. Oftentimes, she just would have this creeped out feeling that she was being watched and followed around the house. Well, her boyfriend and roommate worked nights, and so she was often home alone at nighttime. And on this one particular evening, she was in fact home alone, and she was going through her nighttime routine. She was watching a little TV before bed, and that same sense of dread and being creeped out came over her. And as she was sitting there watching TV, she couldn't make herself look down the bedroom hallway, let alone walk down there. And this persisted for about two hours of just feeling particularly on edge about the hallway. But after a while, she was tired and sleepy, and she said, you know what, this is ridiculous. I'm just freaking myself out over nothing. I'm going to bed. So she walks down that hallway. She leaves the lights on in the hallway, but she goes and shuts herself in her bedroom, gets into bed, flips off the lamp, and tries to go to sleep. And as she's laying there in bed in the dark, all of a sudden, she starts hearing a sound. And it's the sound of her side table drawer creaking open and clicking to a stop. She immediately flips on the lamp and looks and nothing's out of place. She flips the lamp back off and this continues to happen about another six times before she finally says, screw it, I'm sleeping with the lights on. So she pulls the covers up over her head and she's just at this point waiting for her boyfriend to come home. And around 3 a.m., her boyfriend does come home and she's like, thank God. And she tells him everything that's gone on. And he makes fun of her and he's like, you are being ridiculous. You got yourself freaked out over nothing. It's time to go to sleep. So he flips off the lights, he gets in bed and all hell breaks loose. One by one, the doors in the hallway start slamming shut. Boom, 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 boom. The closet doors in every room of the house start rattling violently. And the sounds from inside these closets sound like utter destruction. We're talking things being ripped off of hangers, the poles in the closets being ripped down. It just sounds like total chaos. And Mary and her boyfriend are literally hiding under the covers together, absolutely terrified. Everything finally went quiet, and it took about five or ten minutes for Mary to convince her boyfriend to go check out the house. And they knew it wasn't their roommate because their roommate had actually driven three hours to see a friend. So the boyfriend goes and checks out the house, opens the closet doors. Nothing is out of place. Needless to say, Mary's boyfriend became a believer, and they moved out of that house shortly after. Y'all, I'm on my way to a million followers. Please hit that follow button, like, and comment. That helps the algorithm show my videos to more people. Cheers. The fact that this was the last person that 11-year-old Audrey Cunningham saw before she was killed is horrific. On the morning of February 15th, Audrey disappeared while on her way to the bus stop in Livingston, Texas. She was last seen at around 7 that morning, and the last person that she was with was 42-year-old Don Stephen McDougall. Don was a family friend of the Cunninghams who lived in a trailer behind their home, and he would occasionally walk Audrey to the bus stop or even take her to school if she missed the bus. Audrey lived with her dad, her grandparents, and a few other family members on that same property as Don. After she failed to show up to school and after missing the bus, Audrey was reported missing by school officials and a massive search was launched. Very early on, Don was really vocal about being innocent and he made it a point to join in on the search efforts for the little girl. He was seen going to multiple houses in the community, knocking on doors and asking if anybody had seen her. He even reportedly took to Facebook, commenting on posts about Audrey being missing, saying things like, quote, I'm not guilty. But just one day after Audrey was reported missing, Don was arrested on an unrelated assault charge. And according to police, he immediately became a person of interest in Audrey's disappearance. The following day, police found Audrey's backpack near the Lake Livingston Dam, and it was at this point that they started investigating Don's cell phone data and local surveillance footage to piece together three different locations of interest, which included the Trinity River, just 10 miles from Audrey's home. And sadly, on February 20th, five days after she disappeared, a dive team found Audrey's body in the Trinity River under the U.S. Highway 59 bridge in Livingston. 
She was found underwater tied to a large rock with rope that was linked back to similar rope that was found in Don's car. Her cause of death is still undetermined pending autopsy, but police do believe that she was murdered the same day that she disappeared. Don was still in jail when Audrey's body was found. He has since been charged with capital murder and is now being held without bond. This is so upsetting for many reasons, but the main reason is because Don has a very lengthy criminal history dating all the way back to the early 2000s. In 2008 alone, Don was convicted on two child enticement charges. This is the definition of that for anyone wondering, and for those charges, he was sentenced to two years, yet he was released early. And on top of that, for some reason, he wasn't required to register as a sex offender. Multiple people that knew Don, including a former boss and a co-worker, said that he was a really bad person. He threatened to kill his old boss over $50 and tried to stab his old co-worker after he slashed all of his tires. Don's most recent conviction was a harassment charge in 2020 in which he spent a week in jail for. According to police, Audrey's dad was reportedly aware that Don had a criminal background, but that he didn't know about the former charges involving children. Multiple different people let Audrey down. This is not the outcome that anybody was hoping for, but hopefully now Don will be charged accordingly and there will be some justice for Audrey. This man kept his victims inside this horrendous torture chamber. David Parker Ray lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It's reported he started assaulting women when he was just a teenager. He was fascinated by indecent images, would create disturbing drawings of his own, and ended up using alcohol and substances. He would eventually get married and then divorced four times. It was the 19th of March, 1999, and David actually had a girlfriend at the time. Her name was Cindy Hendy. On the day in question, David approached a woman named Cynthia Vigil in a car park. He pretended to be an undercover police officer and pretended she was under arrest. He then abducted her and took her back to his torture chamber. Now the chamber was this purpose-built trailer that was actually soundproof. He nicknamed it his Toy Box and he would ultimately be called the Toy Box Killer. Horrifyingly, David played Cynthia a disturbing tape recording explaining what he was about to do to her. He then assaulted and awed her over the next agonizing three days. Cindy helped David to torture the victim. Luckily for Cynthia, Cindy accidentally left some keys on the side, so she was able to make a break for it. Brave Cynthia ran to a neighbor's trailer with no clothes on, wearing a dog collar and restraints. The neighbor obviously immediately alerted police and the sordid truth started to unfold. Police arrested David and started to search his property. They found horrific instruments and weapons in the trailer and diagrams on the wall of how to inflict hideous pain. They also found video evidence of him aring another victim. Then another victim came forward to say that she had been awed by David and dumped by the side of the road. She had reported this to police, but they just didn't investigate it. Cindy soon turned on David and started to cooperate with police. She told them how David had actually been helped by his own daughter, Jessie, and also a friend named Dennis. Dennis told police that they had murdered a woman named Marie Parker and they had strangled her to death in 1997. Police also eventually identified the woman in the videotape that they found. The woman's name was Kelly Garrett, and she was actually a friend of David's daughter, Jessie. In 1996, she'd been drinking at a bar when Jessie actually spiked her drink. Jessie and David then took her back to the trailer. Despite having her throat cut by David and being left on the side of the road, she did survive. Frustratingly, police actually didn't believe her account of what had happened, and neither did her husband. He accused her of cheating and divorced her. So much of David's crimes are still unknown to this day, but it's believed that he would kidnap about four to five women a year and hold them captive for around two to three months each. He was eventually given a sentence of over 223 years in prison in connection with kidnapping and other charges involving two women. Jesse got just nine years. Cindy was given 36 years in prison and Cindy and Jesse are both now free. David died of a heart attack in 2002, age 62. Come here. Coined the phrase, you can't make this stuff up, like I've known the story of real-life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with grey hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic child murderer and cannibal. This former NFL player is one of the most evil men in the sport's history. Meet Darren Sharper, a former football safety who played in the NFL for 14 seasons. During the course of his career, Darren played on a number of different teams, including the Green Bay Packers, the Minnesota Vikings, and ultimately the New Orleans Saints. Now, Darren was an incredibly good player, and he frequently signed contracts for over $2 million a year. His career ended in the year 2010 after a devastating injury that he suffered. And it was after he retired from the NFL when he committed a string of despicable crimes. 
In March of 2011, two women in Miami came forward to the police and stated that Darren had drugged them and assaulted them in his condo. Now, even though both of these women had detailed matching accounts about what happened, they were taken to the hospital for grape examination. The investigation was closed by the Miami PD just five days after it was opened. And evidence shows that the detective on the case never even visited Darren's apartment, he never questioned Darren, and he never sent in the rape kits for further examination. And I think getting away with this really set Darren off. Next, in February of 2013, he helped drug a model at a Super Bowl party. And Darren's friend then proceeded to assault her. In August 2013, he allegedly assaulted another woman in New Orleans. Then in September 2013, he drugged two women with his friend and assaulted both of them. Now, keep in mind, every time that this was happening, these women were going to the police and investigations were being opened. But nothing was being done. Keep in mind, this was such a high-profile case that the prosecution eventually admitted that they, yeah, delayed some of the proceedings because they didn't want to mess this up. But in delaying these proceedings, Darren was allowed to continue on his spree of terror. October 2013, Darren drugs two women and assaults one of them in his hotel room. They go to the police and still nothing's done. November 2013, Darren comes across three students who go to the University of Arizona. He drugs all three of them and then assaults two of them. Both women underwent examinations within 12 hours of the assault and went to the police. January 2014, Darren meets two women at two different Hollywood parties. He then takes them back to his hotel room, drugs them, and assaults both of them, and they both go to the police. Then, the day after this previous assault in LA, Darren is in Las Vegas. He meets two women and a man that are out at a club drinking, and he drugs all three of them before he takes the two women back to his hotel room to assault both of them. So keep in mind, for a nine-month period, there were pending charges against Darren. He'd been reported to authorities multiple times for assaulting women, and yet none of these agencies worked together, and he was allowed to roam the streets freely and keep committing crimes. This was an absolutely massive failure of the justice system, and this case still is so shocking because this really was an extended spree of crimes that he was just basically allowed to commit. In 2016, though, Darren was finally sentenced to 20 years in prison. And shockingly, he's going to be released from prison in 2028, which means he only served 12 years of that 20-year sentence. I personally don't think that's nearly enough for all of these assaults, but that's the American justice system for you. This one is just absolutely heartbreaking. This is the last ever picture taken of 12-year-old Samina Halliwell. Samina was loved so much by all of her family, but she did struggle socially. She found it very difficult to speak to people she wasn't familiar with as she was autistic. But she did start speaking to somebody online in spring 2021 and she agreed to meet up with him. He was an older boy and they'd been chatting online. He said that he went to the same high school as her, so she wasn't phased in the slightest about meeting up with him to hang out. Only this wasn't an innocent meeting and 12-year-old Samina ended up being sexually assaulted by this boy. She soon became really withdrawn at home and she started self-harming. Her mother, Rachel, noticed some signs and she confronted Samina and Samina broke down and told her absolutely everything. Of course, Rachel was determined to hold her daughter's attacker accountable for what he did to Samina and she took her to see Merseyside police. Only the police were the complete opposite of what Rachel thought they would be like. They basically sat Samina down and complained about how much form filling they'd have to do, how much paperwork they'd be. They basically told her that it was his word against hers and that it probably wouldn't go to court for up to two years and that she wouldn't want that hanging over her head. They basically told her to stay indoors to limit the chances of coming into contact with her attacker. But of course, Samina still needed to go to school. She was in her first year at high school and instead of her classmates being supportive of her, they were the complete opposite and Samina was subjected to horrific assaults that were often filmed and posted online. Her siblings were targeted as well as her mum Rachel with people telling them that if they went to the police, they'd have their heads kicked in. Again, they contacted the police and they did visit them in June 2021 and they spoke to Samina. But again, she was made to feel like an inconvenience. Eventually, Samina stood up and said that she'd had enough and she went upstairs. What Rachel thought she meant was that she'd had enough of the police interview. What she actually meant was that she had enough of everything. She went upstairs to her room and took a lethal dose of medication. 
Samina was rushed to hospital. Heartbreakingly, she asked the doctor if she was going to die before her organs started to shut down. She suffered four heart attacks and she passed away on June 12th, 2021, with family by her side. As if that wasn't all horrific enough, the abuse didn't stop after Samina's death. Her family had cruel taunts sent to them, awful messages, and the videos of Samina's assaults resurfaced online. People even sent photoshopped messages to Samina's family, showing Samina laying in a coffin on the day of her funeral. After Samina was laid to rest, it still didn't stop. People were posting videos online, offering cash for anyone that would desecrate Samina's grave. Again, Rachel went to the police and again, she wasn't taken seriously. She has branded Merseyside police absolutely disgusting and attributed Samina's death to them, along with Samina's attacker and his parents. It's heartbreaking to think that if Samina had been supported by those investigators at the most difficult time of her life, she might still be here today. There's a really strange missing persons case happening right now that everybody should be talking about. This is Anna Knezovic. She went missing after temporarily moving to Spain from Florida this month, and the details surrounding her case are bizarre. In January, Anna and her husband David separated after being together for 13 years. They both lived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and Anna's family said that the divorce was pretty nasty. So to get away and to kind of clear her head, Anna decided to temporarily move to Spain. More specifically, she moved to a luxury apartment in the upscale neighborhood of Salamanca in Madrid. Madrid. She originally only rented the apartment there until February 5th, but she vanished on February 2nd and no one has seen her since. That evening, Anna was in her apartment and had an hour-long conversation with a friend on the phone at around 8.30 p.m. According to the friend, everything seemed normal and Anna said that she didn't plan on going out that night. But this is where things start to get strange. Later that night, a man in a helmet covering his face was caught on the security cameras at Anna's apartment building. He spray-painted two security cameras in the front of the building and by an elevator leading outdoors with black paint disabling them. That night, Anna vanished and nothing was caught on security footage because of this. The next day, Anna's friend and brother received a string of mysterious texts from Anna's phone that they believe were not from her. The text said that just the day before, she met someone wonderful. It was a man who approached her while she was walking on the street and she said the connection was amazing and unlike anything she had ever experienced. Anna then said that she was going to a summer house with him, which was about two hours outside of Madrid and that she would be gone for a few days. She said that the phone signal would be spotty, but that she would call them when she got back. But according According to Anna's brother and her friend, the text seemed really disconnected, they didn't sound like Anna at all, and they switched between English and Spanish. Almost like they'd been translated from a computer. Those who know Anna say that she would never do something like this. Not only is it extremely unsafe, but Anna would never just run off with someone that she just met. On top of that, the friend that received those text messages was the same friend that was on the phone with Anna the night she disappeared. And according to her, Anna never mentioned anything about a man or running off with him that night. I saw an apartment that I loved yesterday so hopefully it will be mine <laughs> I don't know and now I'm on my way to see another one and everything is doing great I'm, I'm feeling actually really good I'm going on Monday to Barcelona with a friend of mine it's just a day trip we're going and then we're coming back and she's very excited about it Anna has not been seen or heard from since, and she was officially reported missing on February 5th. Adding to the mystery is the fact that Anna was supposed to catch a train to Barcelona with a friend on the 5th, yet she never showed. Authorities in Spain were able to get into her apartment a week after she was reported missing, but found no signs of a break-in or any signs of a crime. According to Anna's neighbor, her lights were still on at 1 a.m. the morning of the 3rd, but if she was actually in her apartment at that time is unknown. What's also unclear is if there's any connection between Anna's disappearance and the unknown man who spray-painted the security cameras. Although to me, that does not seem like a coincidence. Anna's family has stated that the separation between her and her estranged husband David was pretty nasty, adding that there was a substantial amount of money on the line to be split up between the two, and that did not make David happy. While they were married, the two owned three different corporations together that provided technology and support for South Florida businesses. But right after the two separated, David traveled back to his hometown in Serbia and was not in Spain or around Anna when she disappeared. As of right now, David is not a person of interest or suspect in the case, and he has been cooperating with authorities. Police in Madrid and Florida have since launched their own investigations into Anna's disappearance, but she remains missing to this day. Her family has since created a GoFundMe to help hire a private investigator, so I'll share that here. If you have any information about the disappearance of Anna Knezovic, please contact the number on the screen.
This is the UK's most famous missing boy. In September 2007, Andrew Gosden was just 14 years old. He was a very intelligent boy and was top of his class in most classes at school. He was an introvert that usually spent most of his time at home. The day before Andrew went missing seemed completely normal. He went to school, he had some tea, and then he watched some TV. However, on September the 14th, he seemed more irritable than normal. Instead of getting the bus to school that morning like his parents thought he was, he went to a cash point and withdrew 200 pounds. CCTV then captures him walking home where he changed his clothes into a Slipknot t-shirt. When he left the house, he didn't take his charger with him and he also didn't take 100 pounds that he'd saved up. He didn't take his passport, but he did take his house key, which indicates he was gonna come home. He bought a one-way ticket to London and was last seen leaving King's Cross Station at about half past 11. Frustratingly, the school had actually tried to contact Andrew's parents to say that he hadn't turned up to school that day, but they dialed the wrong number and left an answer phone message on the wrong phone. His family was completely cleared of any suspicion and the family and the school and all of the students went to London and they were handing out loads of flyers. Weirdly, a year after this incident, a man came to a police station to say that he had information about Andrew. Now, the police station was unmanned, so the person spoke to this man just over an intercom system and sent a police officer down there. Mysteriously, by the time the police officer arrived, the person had vanished. This is what Andrew might look like now, just being the age that he may be if he's still alive. Theories about this case is that he may have gone to London to meet up with someone or go to a concert. Was he lured there by somebody with bad intentions or was he just going there for the day, gonna come back and was at the wrong place at the wrong time and somebody did something bad to him? In 2009, the family paid for a search of the River Thames to try and find some sort of closure. The search did find a body, but it wasn't Andrew's. The most up-to-date information that we have on this case is that two men were arrested on suspicion of kidnapping Andrew, but they've actually been released. This young boy was tortured in a very brutal way, and this is one of the worst true crime cases ever. On the evening of July 29th, 1995, 13-year-old Thad Phillips, who was on the bottom, was sleeping on the couch with his sister in their new home in Baraboo, Wisconsin. When someone picked Philip up off the couch and he assumed it was his father carrying him to bed, which was a common occurrence. Disoriented when he woke up, Phillips found he was outside with an unfamiliar older teenage boy. The boy seemed friendly, asking Phillips if he could help him with his car. Phillips, who was still sleepy and confused, went with the boy back to his home, which was only half a mile away from Phillips' new house. Once there, the mysterious boy introduced himself as Joe and his full name is Joe Clark and he is on the top. Joe then said that he's going to throw a party and he named other boys that Phillips knew and said that they will be here soon. In the meantime, he asked Phillips if he wanted to check out his model cars upstairs. Phillips followed Joe Clark up the stairs unaware of the violence that awaited him. Once Phillips was upstairs, Clark reportedly shed his friendly teen persona and Clark, who was 17 years old, grabbed Phillips and threw him on a dirty bed jumped on him and then grabbed him by the ankle. He then began to twist Phillips' foot around his leg until the bone above his ankle snapped and splintered. The torment inflicted upon Phillips was severe, occurring for hours at a time. Clark reportedly mistreated Phillips as a way to manage his daily frustrations. In one case, Clark's car wouldn't start, so he twisted Phillips' leg until they splintered, then broke the boy's knees and even jumped on his chest. And when Phillips tried to fight back or escape, the torment grew even more brutal. Clark pushed a pillow over Phillips' face to suffocate him. This abuse took place for approximately 43 hours in total. After the initial attack broke Phillips' leg near the ankle, Joe Clark threw the shocked boy on the couch downstairs. And Phillips was trying to figure out an escape plan and told Clark he wouldn't tell anyone what happened. And he would just say that he tripped and broke his ankle. But Clark just kept telling him that nobody would ever believe this. Phillips then attempted to reason with Clark, asking why he would do this. He then said he'd done something like this before and described how much he loved it. During his 43 hours of captivity, Thad Phillips made at least two attempts to escape Joe Clark. The first attempt happened immediately after Clark broke Phillips' ankle. Phillips reportedly felt more shock than pain and was able to leap off the bed towards the stairs but sadly was quickly caught by Clark. Phillips then suffered further injuries, including having his leg stretched back until his thigh bone fractured. In his second attempt, Phillips managed to crawl down the stairs and into the kitchen before Clark returned home with his girlfriend. 
The two reportedly watched television in the living room as Phillips hid in the kitchen, but Clark found Phillips as soon as the girl left. After that, Phillips would be locked in a closet whenever Clark left the house. In between attacks on Phillips, Clark reportedly fiend for friendship. During this downtime, Clark would carry Phillips to the couch so that the pair could watch movies together. Clark spoke about his family, his car, how he lived with his brother in his filthy house, and his girlfriend who was in the house at the time that Phillips was being held captive. The most shocking revelation came when Clark told Phillips that he had already murdered two other boys. Aside from pretending to act like a friend, Clark would also switch between torturing Philip and giving care. After Clark would finish a session of breaking bones, he would take white socks and wrap them over Phillips' broken legs until they became thickly padded. Clark also forced Phillips to wear leg braces and attempt to walk around before beginning another cycle of torture. Phillips later said that Clark would stomp on his broken bones after tending to the wounds. After his attempted escape, Stad Phillips was placed in a bedroom closet while Clark left the house on the evening of July 31st. Locked in the closet, Phillips felt around for a weapon until he found an electric guitar which he used to break down the closet door. Phillips then crawled from the bedroom closet and threw himself down the stairs, passing out multiple times due to weakness and the excruciating pain of his injuries. Once he made it downstairs, Phillips was able to find a phone and called 911. Police arrived at the scene before Clark's return and quickly put him under arrest. This case is absolutely chilling and I don't want to make it too long so I'm going to stop here. But if you want a part 2 explaining the aftermath of everything, I could easily make it. But yeah, can you imagine having your bones repeatedly broken over and over again over 43 hours? I can't even imagine that and this is such a brutal case and thank god that Phillips escaped. Imagine getting married only to be decapitated by your husband three months later. 21-year-old couple Jared and Angie got married in October 2022. Around 4pm on the 11th of January, police were called to their home in Texas. Police made a grim discovery in the pair's bathroom after finding, quote, what appeared to be the head of the victim to be in the shower, end quote. Angie's body was discovered on the floor near the bed in a pool of blood with multiple stab wounds to her back. It was actually Jared's poor parents that initially made this discovery after entering the home. They then obviously alerted police to what they found. Jared was arrested and has confessed to killing his wife with a kitchen knife. Jared was actually captured on CCTV, casually stealing a bottle of beer from Angie's workplace just minutes after it's believed that he killed her. Angie's friends have reported to police that the couple's relationship was toxic and Jared was very controlling. Jared's bond is currently set at $500,000. This is Jared Fogle, one of the worst pedophiles in American history. So if you don't know who Jared Fogle was, he was the spokesperson for Subway for a number of years. Jared initially became famous and then eventually became the spokesman of Subway because he dropped so much weight while eating a Subway diet. According to Jared, he lost almost 245 pounds while eating almost exclusively from Subway. Obviously, this was a huge story and when Subway heard about this, they contacted Jared and eventually made him the spokesman for their entire company. I swear to God, I remember this. For years, you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing this guy's face. So in 2004, when Jared was at the height of his popularity, he launched the Jared Foundation, a foundation determined to fight childhood obesity. This foundation saw Jared touring schools across the nation, talking to kids about losing weight, and yeah, just being heavily involved with children, which people at the time thought was a great thing. But it was when he was away from the cameras, behind the scenes, when Jared was engaging in some of the most deplorable behavior I've ever read about. So in 2007, a radio host and journalist from Florida came forward to the FBI and reported that Jared was saying and doing some concerning things. Apparently, while at a middle school event, Jared had been talking to her about performing lewd acts on a minor. He had texted her about all of these things, and she even recorded him saying all this stuff. At one point, apparently, Jared even asked this journalist if she could install webcams in her children's bedroom so he could watch them. Obviously, this was concerning. This journalist recorded all of this, turned it into the FBI, but they told her that they couldn't do anything because they didn't have enough evidence. And now we got to talk about Russell Taylor, a guy who was heavily involved in Jared's foundation. So when he wasn't working on the Children's Foundation, this guy, Russell Taylor, was producing CP in his home. Apparently, between the years 2011 and 2015, Russell Taylor had videotaped minors in his own home and traded photographs of them with none other than, you guessed it, Jared Fogel, King of the Footlong. According to court documents, Jared actually asked Russell if he could move some of the nanny cams in his home so he could watch children in varying states of undress or while they were naked taking a bath. 
Russell also claimed that Jared made him set up accounts on porn sites in his name, and he wanted to basically run his whole CP operation for him. Well, shortly after Russell Taylor was arrested, Jared Fogle's home was raided, and guess what they found? A ton of CP. On the same day that his home was raided, Subway severed all ties with Jared, and some new disturbing facts came to light during the trial. Apparently, years prior, Jared had been texting a Subway franchisee named Cindy, and over these texts, he talked about wanting to abuse kids aged 9 to 16, he told Cindy she should sell herself for sex on Craigslist, and even asked her to arrange a sexual meetup between him and her 16-year-old cousin. Eventually, Jared pled guilty to possession of CP and traveling to conduct an illicit sexual behavior with a minor. Apparently, while in New York City, he paid to have sex with a 17-year-old girl. But this story isn't over yet. I'm going to post part two, and it definitely gets more interesting from here on out. This schoolboy stabbed his teacher to death in front of a classroom full of students. 61-year-old Anne Maguire was a Spanish teacher teaching in Leeds. She'd actually worked at the school for 40 years and she was only five months off retirement. However, in April 2014, something absolutely horrific happened. One of her students was 15-year-old Will Cornick. He'd always been described as a smart student who never really caused any trouble. Classmates regarded him as a polite student, but after he got diagnosed with diabetes, his personality seemed to change. In 2013, he tried to join the army, but because of his diagnosis, he was rejected. Being in the army had been his dream, so this was really upsetting for him. After failing to complete his Spanish homework, he was given detention by Anne. He also expressed a wish to her that he wanted to drop Spanish, but she wouldn't let him, which only angered him more. He began to develop a deep-rooted grudge against Anne. Shockingly, he reportedly messaged his friends on Facebook asking if one of them would kill her for him for £10. During one school day, halfway through his Spanish class, Will decided to get up and attack Anne with a knife. The classmates watched on in horror as he chased her out of the classroom. When there, another teacher heard her screams and tried to shield Anne from any more blows from him. Will then allegedly returned to his class and told his classmates how it was a shame that he hadn't killed her. However, Anne did actually pass away from her injuries. Will later admitted that he did plan also to kill two other teachers. One of them was actually pregnant at the time. He's been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, did not act alone. This TikTok series is about to blow your mind, but there's a lot of information here, so proceed with caution. The case of John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer clown, is one of the most infamous true crime stories in American history. A brief overview of the case, in the 1970s, John Wayne Gacy murdered 33 young men. He buried them in the crawl space beneath his home and his yard, and he was connected to a number of different crimes. Gacy himself gained infamy because he dressed up as Pogo the Clown on the weekends and volunteered at hospitals and children's birthday parties. Now, the official story says that John Wayne Gacy acted completely alone. He had no help in carrying out any of these murders, but I really don't believe that that's the case. Through all of our research that we did for our podcast, we've determined that Gacy was connected to a number of other killers, pedophiles across America. And he even may have been connected to one of America's other most infamous serial killers, the Candyman out of Houston, Texas. So before we get into this, I want to state that I do believe that Gacy did murder some people, and I think he was very complicit in all of this, obviously, but I don't think that he acted alone. But why do I think that? So to start off, we need to talk about Jeffrey Rignall, this guy who was actually a survivor of John Wayne Gacy. After a night of abuse and essay at the hands of John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Rignall was allowed to go free. But what Jeffrey would go on to tell authorities and the media about what happened that night at Gacy's home is a major thing in this whole conspiracy. Now, Jeffrey would tell the police that while Gacy was essaying him, there was another man in the room. Now, whether or not this other man participated in the essaying or they were there to watch, it doesn't matter. Someone was watching this criminal act occur. He knew he could give a description of the guy, and he knew that someone else was there watching this happen. Then we get to Robert Bob Gilroy, who was a victim of John Wayne Gacy. So Robert Gilroy was abducted on September 15th, 1977. That's the official date that he went missing. He was supposed to show up for an event after that day, but he never showed. But John Wayne Gacy's plane tickets and records placed him as being out of the state at the time. His plane tickets from the time show that Gacy left Illinois on September 12th, and he didn't return until September 16th, the day after Robert Gilroy went missing. Already, these two facts point to a larger conspiracy at hand. There may have been people helping procure victims for Gacy, and he may have been even paying for these victims. 
And that's when we get to Philip Paskey and John David Norman, two of the most horrific people I've ever read about. And this is where the connections with the case start to get really shocking. And we've talked about John David Norman here on my TikTok before. This guy was connected with the higher ups in the government. This guy had lots of political power and he was a known pedophile. Remember, in earlier TikToks, I even told you about how John David Norman was arrested multiple times. He had Rolodexes full of index cards of the people who he was supplying these young men to. And both times, the police departments lost the Rolodexes and lost all the names of the abusers. But how did they connect to Gacy? Well, in part two, we're going to talk about it. This is one of the most horrific cases I've heard recently, so please be warned before watching. 29-year-old Taylor Parker has just been sentenced to death for a crime so horrendous that I can't believe a human is capable of this. Regan Simmons Hancock and Taylor had met online. Their online friendship soon blossomed into a real-life connection. It was 2022 and Regan was married with a young daughter. She was also eight months pregnant at this time. Taylor was also pregnant, or so it would seem to the outside world. She was posting pregnancy pictures on social media and even hosted a gender reveal party. Little did her loved ones know that she was actually staging the entire thing. Regan and Taylor were really good friends around this time and they were bonding over their pregnancies. Regan even shared a Facebook status thanking Taylor for bringing her around a gift and Starbucks. This was the day before she would be murdered by Taylor. On Taylor's supposed due date, she made her way round to Regan's house in Texas. Shortly after, Regan's mum made a horrifying discovery. Her daughter was face down on the floor, deceased with blood everywhere. Her mum rang the emergency services and they raced to the scene. It became apparent that her baby had been, and again, a massive, massive trigger warning here, ripped out of her stomach and Regan had been stabbed over a hundred times. Meanwhile, Taylor was pulled over for speeding and driving erratically. She'd actually put the baby in her lap with the umbilical cord coming out of her trousers to make it seem like she'd just given birth. When the pair were taken to hospital, the horrors of what actually happened became apparent. The newborn baby tragically passed away and Taylor was arrested. She was sentenced to death, but her defense lawyer said that her loved ones should have done more to protect her earlier on when she was pretending to be pregnant. 